Welcome to Growth Quest. Today we have the honor and privilege to have Mark Kamling, Group Data Scientist of Maybank, with us today. And she's going to share some insights about big data and how marketers can actually benefit from this amazing new trend that is gripping the world of marketing. Uh, my name is Kamlin. Uh, I'm Group Data Scientist in Maybank. I uh, just joined two years ago. Before that, I worked in the telco for 23 years. I work in Australia, spend most of my growing up time in Australia. Undergraduate, postgraduate, I worked in Australia before. So uh, I think my, my journey is, uh, as a data scientist is accidental, not planned or intended in whatever way, but it's just a passion to look at data and interpret data. Yeah? Absolutely. Okay. I, I think, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your time when you used to fly satellites. That sounds so fascinating. <laughs> uh, flying satellite is, uh, is in fact very interesting. You actually have to, you, you have to secure an operator slot with International Telecommunication Union in, uh, at Geneva. And uh, Malaysia filed for three slots then when we were there. And then you have to build the satellite, you have to design the satellite, you have to get the launcher, you have to evaluate the launcher. Martin Lott, uh, we work with uh, Ariane France and uh, Japan H2 and Long March and we have to do all the evaluation. Those are not the s not so glamorous or not so exciting time, but you have to look through all the uh, tender document. And we built, uh, we were in El Segundo, Los Angeles. We then we launch. Launch was interesting because you have to bring the satellite up to a certain level, geostationary. Then the job is to keep the satellite in the box. So a lot of people ask me, why isn't it automated? Uh, intentionally, we put human decision into the whole process because every satellite behaves differently when they reach the space. So you can't just automate everything. And satellite, there's a, limit, a limitation of how much fuel we have. We cannot halfway through and then go and pump petrol. Is it no such a thing? Eh? Hydrazine is that's this much, and you have to use it for a lifespan of a satellite. Now, the reason they hired, uh, they train uh, orbiter analysts is to make sure that we maximize the petrol. Because once it's done, the lifespan of satellite is gone. Yeah. So of course, we have a lot of trick. Eh? We can put it in inclined orbit, you know, we fire the satellite as and when we think it's the right time. Then up in the sky is interesting because when the sun shines on the satellite, the solar wind, the satellite actually get pushed. And then you have sun and moon and you have everything. So, so what you study in school, you actually use it. Nah? So if people tell you you never use anything you study in school, it's not true. You actually study every formula, the rocket formula, everything is being used and Every day you use it to fly the satellite. So when we were flying the satellite, we also have to start looking at data. Because data is the one that tells us where the satellite is. It's 36,000 kilometers up in the space. You can't see it. Sometimes my friends say, oh, at night I saw one light flying around, that's your satellite. I say, no, satellite doesn't have a light. And you can't see it. it's too far away. So the satellite commu com uh, communicate with us every second of the time. They just uh, stream down telemetry. With the data, we interpret the condition of the satellite. So that's how that's how it works. And satellite is cold. Turn on the heater. At a certain time, you have to start your charging of the battery and just keep the satellite in good health. That's what we do. And from then, I realized data is very powerful. Yeah. Okay. So that's how it started my journey to look at data. Yeah. Then over the years, I took care of. Uh, Mechanical, electrical, civil structure engineering for the company, and then move on to managing huge programs. Launch the iPhone, and uh, as the time evolved, I got interested in geo marketing. So, looking at data, looking at micro market, looking at uh, areas that we can improve bottom line and high potential under tap market high revenue underserved market. Those are always the key areas that I look into. Yeah. Then as I evolve, evolve a bit more, uh, I've gotten the portfolio to be head of a business intelligence office. 
then uh, I was invited to join Maybank, so I joined Maybank as group data scientist. That's how the whole career summarized. Fantastic. Yeah. What, a, what a wonderful, Strange. awesome career. And, and, and I guess the journey is just beginning for you, with, especially with data and, uh, right. and, yeah. and what, what you can do with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, today's marketers, they really, really need data to drive their decision making. And, uh, and data is becoming very complex, mm -hmm. and, and data is uh, becoming... Uh, what, what is big data? Maybe you can just give me a, uh, you know, from a marketer perspective, how, how can, can one get their head around mm. big data? I don't pretend that I have a real definition of big data. I think so far nobody really wants to define it yet. Uh, big data, is it a very large amount of data, or is it a lot of data sources? So I live to everybody, experts to interpret it. For my understanding, uh, big data is good provided you can really manage it. If you don't know how to manage big chunk of data, you start buying a lot of expensive platforms, a lot of expensive applications to translate the data, which after translated, you don't know how to use it. Uh, pardon me, because I think a lot of vendors trying to sell very expensive storages and it's not a bad thing if you know how to use it. If you don't know how to use it, then you really need to evaluate your, again, your needs and your wants. Huh? Do you want to be known that you have big data solution or you just want to, is it a need? So that, I think every organization has to evaluate that. Now, again, big data for me uh, is valuable data. I have met some very, very uh, learned uh, professors uh, that uh, they actually use big data. What they do, what they are doing, one of the uh, efforts that uh, international effort they're doing is they track like three, four hundred thousands of uh, fast moving consumer goods in every country. Okay, so they track every day, every second, every hour they track. So from that trend, you can actually understand the movement of the stock, the demand, and so and so forth, expiry date and all those parameters. Those I think is big data because they combine it with the local environment, local market condition, economy of the country and so and so forth. And the company that uh, selling it and you know and the local GBD that uh, the affordability of uh, the consumers and towards all these goods and so and so forth. Those are real complex uh, mathematic models that use fully utilize the uh, what do you call that, uh, big data. In a smaller outfit, a uh, smaller, more controlled environment, we really have to think, do we have that intelligence to run that? Do we need that type of data? Do you, can you secure that data source or can you just buy off the shelf, which you have questioned, que you question where the sources come from. So to that extent, uh, marketers want to use data, they need to also understand their own capacity, their own market, do you what, what do you want to do? Yeah, doesn't mean you want a vehicle, you buy a Rolls Royce. Yeah, sometimes a small little car would do, and sometimes you do need a Rolls Royce. Yeah, so that's my opinion about big data. Not so much of uh, we want it, or you may not know how to use it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So that's how uh, that's how how I interpret big data. For I. My exposure is very limited. I'm, I work in a telco for 23 years. I work in a bank now. But as far as I understand, telco data is very, very rich. So currently, work in a bank, also very, very rich. Yeah? Okay, no pun intended, but it's very rich. <laughs> okay. So when you look at data, so I was thinking that uh, the previous company, I look at about 10, 12 million customers' behavior. In the bank, I'm looking at another 13, 14 million customer. So the country has about 35, 33,000 million. So I'm reading two third. There are overlaps. So I'm reading customer behavior. I get very intrigued with the uh, Malaysian consumers' behavior after reading the way they spend. Now I look at the way they own or manage the money. So that sort of trigger which company should I work for next <laughs> to have that complete cycle? Eh? So that's what I feel, yeah. It's really a privilege to get to read all this data. But uh, as a data worker, as a professional, we kind of swear by blood eh, that we will not divulge anything that we see. And most of the time, I'm the only one that sees the data. So 
uh, I can get very excited by myself. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what data scientists should do, we interpret it, we mask everything. We will show the hindsight, as I mentioned, and the insight and the foresight with the decision makers and tell them that this is what's happening, this is what happened. We think that this is what will happen with this condition or if you tweak this, this will happen. But if the market condition change, will be this. But if the market dynamics change to that side, I show you the full range, you know. So we simulate model to show them. So we wanted to, the intention is to make sure that decision makers are making decision uh, on fact-based, fact-based decision. So they can look at the whole thing, inform decision, they inform. If I move the dynamics this way, so therefore the visualization you were talking about is very dynamic. I can simulate that if the economy is like this, this is what happens. If the economy is like that, with this segment, this is the reaction. With that segment, so what do you want to do, marketers? So data scientists will not be able to recommend what to do. They can tell you what is going to happen with all this permutation. So marketers and uh, the CFOs, the CMOs, you make decision. So that's how you operate for my understanding, yeah, from my understanding. Right. Okay. Now, in terms of the data itself, you work in financial services now. Uh, it's a highly regulated environment. Of course. How is that impacting your collection of data and your interpretation of it? As I mentioned, uh, we make sure all data are masked and we have to uh, make sure that the PDPA compliance is in place. Actual fact, I don't have to look at your data per se. I can look at uh, a cohort data, then I can interpret from there. Yep. Okay, I think I said too much already. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So that, that has to be uh, managed, yeah, that okay. piece of information. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, ask about is, was there anything along your journey in data that actually surprised you, you know, where you actually were dead set on, on a particular uh, outcome, but the data proved otherwise? Was there anything interesting, uh, perhaps? Yes, but let me think. Huh? Of course, of course. Ah, let's talk about uh, telco spending. We would think that the migrant would be lower income, migrant workers lower income uh, bracket. But they spend more compared to Malaysians. So that's intriguing. And then uh, that's when marketeers come in. It's the emotional connection that they want to call home. They want to be connected, so marketers sort of uh, capitalize that and they sell it to them. So I think it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, making money is good. So that's something that I find it. Uh, I was very surprised when I first saw the data. Yeah, and then when I look at the data many years ago as well, you know that the migrant workers they come from different countries. It's proven now that they they stay in certain areas. They don't mix, huh? Because if they mix, they may fight. <laughs> so again and again, I see that pattern and I thought, mm, interesting. Wherever you go, whichever country you land up, you tend to click among yourselves uh, that people may like, may not like, but it turned out to be that pattern. Yeah? I would think that you come to Malaysia, you start mixing around with different migrants. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. So that was interesting. Then again, I also mentioned that certain customers do not like to be seen. That's proven again and again. I can't quote specific example because of confidentiality, but <clears throat> another thing was interesting that uh, most people, you can locate them 80%, 80-20 again. 80% of the time, if I were to track where you are, you are around three areas, 80%. 20% maybe you go. You are where you work, where you live, and where you hang out. 80% of the time. So you don't have to spend too much time worrying about where about they go? Other than, of course, the exceptionals like the insurance salesman, the people that drives around, the taxi drivers or the Uber drivers, but most of the populations, they just hang around three areas. That's very interesting. I, I never knew that until I, I started working in, uh, with data. Another thing I thought I'd share with you as well. If you own a mobile phone, and in six weeks, you did not make a call or nobody calls you, it's not a real number. I see. 
see. Right. How interesting. Right. So those are the, the things that I, I thought, oh, interesting. And in a bank, <coughs> there, are cus there are customers that uh, do not go to ATM at all. There are customers that every month they have to go and visit ATM. There's also a group of customers, sometimes they go, sometimes they don't go. And the distribution is very, very even. It's so interesting. So those are the things that, uh, well, we can say these are the things that we see. How to interpret and translate it into business initiatives. Yes, of course we can. If not, I wouldn't have quoted all the examples. So all those that I've quoted, in fact, we have translated it into business initiatives and we have seen returns. So therefore, data scientist's job is also able to interpret insights into potential uh, executable uh, business plans. If not, it's also useless. Yeah. So that's how I view data. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Now, if, if I wanted to speak to a data scientist and I wanted to communicate, mm. what are some of the things that, that would give me a, a an age going in prepared, uh, okay. not to waste <coughs> the time of, 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 of this age. individual. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot of uh, the country or a lot of educate, uh, tertiary institution, they're churning out a lot of so-called certified data scientists. Uh, I have my view, as I said, you may not like to hear what I say. They're churning out a lot of uh, hardcore programmers, programming data scientists, very R&D with very little business acumen. Now, if you talk to them, they will want to talk to you about the R, the Pythons, the Hadoop, the, everything that we use every day. It's just that, how do you talk to them? You may not be able to communicate with them because they talk a different language. So be very patient with this group of slightly younger so-called data scientists. But if you work with a more experienced data scientist, you talk to them about business. In fact, my my job, I sit in uh, a lot of meetings. I just listen. In fact, they don't have to talk to me. I just listen. As I listen, I listen to the business needs, listen to pain points, listen to areas that uh, there's a big question mark, a puzzle, and you pick up everything. And then I go and think. I do think once in a while. <laughs> and I come up with solution, and I have to decide what type of data to use to uh, solve the business issue. Now, if you talk to data scientists, it's very easy gauge. If you talk to them about technical and everything, which we all love, but if that's all they talk, then you have an R and D, good R and D uh, data sci scientist. If you talk to a data scientist that talk to you about business, then I think that's the L and D data scientist, applied data science. So they will use the applied science portion to solve business solution. So to, to source business solution. So depending on what type of data scientist you're talking to, a different approach here. Yeah? So that's how I view the whole thing here. Yeah? Okay. So I'm more it? towards the applied data science. Right. So the L and D would be life and death. Life and death. Okay. And the R and D would it's be the the R and D. Research but and I love my R and D. I right. really love I'm building something now uh, which I also cannot disclose, which I think is very exciting and never been done before. So that's how my day-to-day -day life is, uh, working life is. How exciting. It's a, it's a really, I think this is the, uh, it's an uncharted field really right. in many, many ways. So right, we get excited when we don't know what we don't know. So we sit there and find out what we don't know. <laughs> it's a bit silly, but that's how it goes. Yeah. It's good. And not, orga not every organization is ready to have this data science culture. Unless the top management, I'm not talking about senior management, I'm talking top management, give you full support. Uh, it's very hard to institutionalize a data science team in the com company uh, if they don't understand. Because that data science team will disrupt some of the things. They will tell you that this is what you have been doing, we think may not be the way. So are you open, do you have an open mind to listen what they have to say? And data scientists likes to be challenged. Yeah? They, they like to, if you tell them it's wrong, it's okay. Data scientists usually take skin. They will just, okay, they will go back and understand. And if they make a mistake, data scientists have to admit it because sometimes they overlook a certain aspect, certain parameters that they did not incorporate. They have to quickly do it. So when you speak to a data scientist or potential data scientist, you actually have to observe the 
other aspects and attributes of the personality as well, not just the title. Because title doesn't mean much anyway. So, okay. How how could how could marketing uh, actually help a data scientist? What what sort of how, how could they prepare and give uh, them the all the information they need? What what would be the way forward? Marketing, I think important for me uh, for me. I just speaking for myself. Uh, marketers, important most important. Do you know your key strategy? Your what is your strategy pillars? If you cannot define your strategic pillars and your intention and what end game you want to achieve, it's very hard for data scientists to guess because uh, as much as they would like to have the business acumen, but uh, very few uh, marketers end up as a data scientist or a data scientist end up or oh, started off as a marketer. I could be wrong. Yeah. So data scientists, a lot of them uh, with a lot of technical background. Yeah. So. Uh, they may be exposed to business operations and marketings and sales, which I happen to be lucky enough to got hold of that uh, that uh, what exposure from uh, very kind uh, supervisors that I've had so far. And uh, unless you can tell what are you trying to do, they will find you a solution. If you do not know what you want to do, you just leave it to them. They will R and D forever. So. What you can help is you probably need to know. You need to know your business, and hopefully you educate them about your business. Because as I said, the new breed of data scientists probably do not have the business acumen, you know, fresh out from uni. And I still do not know at what point you are qualified to be called a data scientist, and when you are, because I have a team that I have data engineers, I have data analysts, I have data architect, I have different different team members supporting me, so I'm the lucky one, yeah? So that's how I view it, yeah? Marketers are very flamboyant, in my view, very flamboyant, very free-spirited. You can't talk to a data scientist in that manner too much because you go all over the place, they go all over the place, and you ne never achieve anything, yeah? Okay? Okay, that's, that's a good insight. Uh -huh.